So, you know, it's, it's that time of year. If you, if you have to cough, cover up. Uh, I've noticed not a whole lot of coughs going on, which is good, but no one wants to take something home that they didn't come here with. The other thing uh, is that please silence your phones so we don't interrupt people around us. And if you have to chat with your neighbor, please go outside to, to chat. Our first speaker, and I have a bio on him, so I'll read that along, is Hardy Kern. He's the Director of Government Relations, Pesticides and Bird Campaign for American Bird Conservancy, ABC. He's an international, which is an international not-for-profit dedicated to conserving birds and their habitat across America. Hardy has a BS in zoology from Ohio State University and a master's in public administration from Kent State University. Uh, he is a birder. He is one of these people that you see with the, the uh, binoculars out there looking for that one bird that he hasn't had for his list before. Uh, he works on both the federal and the state level and uh, build bridges between stakeholders, legislators, and regulatory uh, on matters of pesticides, lead, and the Endangered Species Act. It is unique that we have Hardy here as a speaker because I think it gives a whole different viewpoint of what we do and how we can make this world better. With that, I would like to introduce you to Mr. Kern. Test, test. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, like Dave said, my name is Hardy Kern. I'm director of government relations, pesticides and birds campaign for American Bird Conservancy, a title which sounds a whole heck of a lot fancier than it actually is, I assure you. Um, and I would also like to first point out that and his announcement about cover your mouth wh uh, while coughing was interrupted by several coughs. So we're off to a roaring start this morning. Uh, this was a really interesting opportunity for me to come and speak to everyone today on uh, the presentation that you're going to see is based on one that I was able to do with Dr. Corrigan um, a few months ago. I did the first part, he'll do the second part, and then we'll do some Q&A at the end. And I also have to say, sharing a stage with Bobby Corrigan is uh, got to be a bit like, you know, somebody new coming to Hollywood and doing a movie with George Clooney. It's just, it's such an honor, so very glad to do that. Uh, to make things a little bit exciting, though, I thought that we'd start off today a little bit like uh, Oprah Winfrey does on her show or did historically. So if everyone would like to check under their seats, you may find a German cockroach. So we'll start there. A little pest control humor for you. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a little bit of a different speaker from a lot of the other people that have been on the slate throughout the conference, but I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to come and talk to everybody. I went to Ohio State University, and so I grew up truly with an enormous reverence for Purdue, and I also grew up as someone who spent a lot of time around farms and in agricultural settings, and uh, my father was a land developer, and so he did a lot of building uh, warehouses and other industrial complexes, and so I know that pest management is such a critical tool to a lot of different parts of human infrastructure. But if you haven't heard of us, and most people haven't, and that's totally understandable, um, my company, American Bird Conservancy, we are a nonprofit organization, and our mission boils down to we are dedicated to conserving wild birds and their habitats throughout the Americas. Um, first off, I, I cannot stand the name of our organization, American Bird Conservancy. No one knows what a conservancy is, but we have ABC as our um, acronym, which works out really well. And this pyramid on the right here, my little tiny pointer, really breaks down what we do very well. So at the very, very top of the, the pyramid that we have, it has endangered birds, so the birds that are most imperiled, the ones most likely to go extinct. We have field staff all across North, Central, and South America. About 80% uh, of our staff is based out in the field doing habitat restoration, working with stakeholders, working with a lot of federal and state partners. The next level down is birds of conservation concern. So these are birds that might be on a decline, ones who have populations that are trending downwards. A few years ago, there was a paper published in the journal Science 
that said since 1970, we have lost about one third of all birds in North America. Not that there is one third less than there were in 1970, but that there, but that there are one third fewer today than there quote unquote should be. So we are seeing a massive decline in bird populations for a bunch of different reasons. And that moves down to the third level where it says threats to all birds. That's where my work lies. So I primarily am focused on environmental toxins. That's everything from mercury to lead to synthetic chemicals, to organic chemicals, things that get put out in the environment. And for anybody who might be, you know, thinking that they can follow me out to my car a little bit later and get me to shut up, I promise you, I'm not here to say pesticides are evil, it's killing wildlife. That is not at all my thing. Our field biologists do a lot of habitat restoration work. We recognize that invasive species are one of the greatest threats to native species that's out there today. And all of those things require some form of pest control. So we are very much in favor of using pest control methods to achieve our conservation goals. And that's really where I work is in that pesticide space. So this is a very basic question, and I don't think I need to tell it to anybody here, but just as a, a very basic starting point, this is where I like to go. Because today what I wanted to talk about is why you might have been getting a lot more letters or requests to sign things, or will you approve this from your trade organizations, from your uh, providers, from the different chemical manufacturers. You know, will you sign this letter? Will you review this? Because the Environmental Protection Agency in the last couple of years has been rolling out regulations around pesticides at a much greater pace than they pretty much ever have before. And if anyone has been sitting there scratching their heads, why the heck is this happening? Um, especially around rodenticides, it's moving really quickly. I wanted to provide a little bit of background today on the federal perspective and how this is sort of trickling down and the benefits that I see from this new regulation, especially as it relates to wildlife conservation. But starting with what is a pesticide? Um, a pesticide, as defined by the EPA, is any substance intended for preventing, destroying, repelling, or mitigating any pest. I say this because we're all in this industry, we're all in this line of work, we know this really well. Most people don't realize what all falls under the umbrella of the word pesticide. When I first started at ABC, I was actually told um, as I started to uh, roll out my work and start to do a couple of internal webinars and just surveying what our field technicians were using, I had people say, no, 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 you're confused. A pesticide is something that kills bugs. You're talking about an herbicide or you're talking about a fungicide. A fungicide is not a pesticide. And basically the way that the law views it, if you go out and you buy a citronella candle or even in some municipalities, a fly swatter, you are buying a pesticide in some form or another, which means that it all falls under this uh, law from the federal government, which is the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, FIFRA. Easy to say, uh, not the most descriptive acronym that comes with it, but basically FIFRA is the law that says how pesticides are registered, regulated, it describes all the processes that go into making the labels. It is the mother of all pesticide regulation that trickles down to the people who are actually out in the field applicating or applying all of these different uh, chemicals. It was passed in 1947. Like I said, it describes uh, labeling requirements. And this is the big one that I think is interesting. This is where a lot of the problems that we see today uh, with this law and the way that it's implemented or interpreted stem from. It was originally uh, administered by the USDA, the Department of Agriculture, which makes a lot of sense, right? The agricultural industry necessarily uses a lot of different chemicals and a lot of different pest mitigating measures However, when Nixon created the Environmental Protection Agency, they actually overtook the administration of FIFRA. It went from the people who are using it out in the field a lot to a regulatory body that was supposed to be more objective, look at evidence, and then make decisions based on that. And this is kind of the first big stumbling block that FIFRA started to um, encounter. 
And the way that FIFRA works at the federal level, and I apologize that this is very elementary, but like I said, it's, it's nice just to get grounded in the basics, is it's a little bit of a different law from others and that it is a cost benefit analysis where it balances the need for pest removal, mitigation, repellency, control, whatever word you wanna put in there, versus human safety and environmental safety. And the reason why it's important to keep this in mind is that FIFRA is designed to say, here's a chemical, here's how we're going to use it, here are the potential risks that it has with it, the environmental contamination, um, any human health impacts that it might have. How does that weigh up against its actual objective, which is pest control or mitigation? Unlike things like, uh, we'll say, the Clean Water Act or something, where the entire goal is protection of a resource, and so if there's contamination going on, we shut it down. FIFRA says, what's the cost versus what's the benefit? And that's very, very different from a lot of other environmentally driven laws or human health protective laws. So the way that the FIFRA prescribed process works, you guys excited for a, a thick governmental process presentation at eight in the morning? Yeah, I know, I see a lot of, a couple of thumbs up and a lot of, so that's good, I know I'm doing well, that's great. Uh, basically, the process that FIFRA prescribes is this. If you're a chemical company, you're a registrant, you come up with a new product and that starts the entire process of registration where you say, here's what I made, we wanna get it out on the market or every 15 years, or it's supposed to be every 15 years, products that are already registered have to undergo review to make sure that they're still being used, that we haven't discovered anything new about it, good, bad, ugly, or otherwise, anywhere in between. Its use is then analyzed for how is it gonna be used, where is it gonna be used, um, what's its rough method of action, what are the inerts versus the active ingredients for a product, you name it. The EPA can then call for additional information if they feel it's necessary. They don't always, in fact, it's only in about one third of cases that they do, but that's because, as many of you know, a lot of products undergo very, very rigorous testing before they even get to this state. So there's a lot of data that comes. Um, on the lab tours yesterday, pretty much everyone that we spoke to in the different insect labs said, well, you know, EPA loves their data. They want a lot of replications. And that's true, more data is more information, that's more things that we can use to make good decisions. After that, they design a label that says how to use it, where to use it, what to be careful of while you're using it, and then it gets released onto the market. The typical timeline now that this takes is about 10 to 12 years. But up until maybe 15, 20 years ago, that timeline could be much shorter. And then for legacy products that were introduced way back when that didn't undergo this same process, and then EPA didn't have the time or the people when those 15 years came up, uh, when that chemical came back around in the cycle, we might have some things in there where there's some knowledge gaps. So why I'm here, why this is a little different, is to talk about this fella, which is the Endangered Species Act. Who here's heard of the Endangered Species Act? Everybody's heard of the Endangered Species Act, right? There's like commemorative stamps for it. Um, it's a really, really fantastic piece of legislation and it just turned 50 years old in 2023. What's so amazing to me about the Endangered Species Act is that it has a 99% success rate of preventing species from going extinct. That means if you are a species that gets federal protections under the ESA, there's almost no chance of you going extinct once you get listed. It's very hard to get put on that list, but once you're there, it does provide some protections. However, the big thing with the ESA is that if any action by any agency may affect an endangered species or adversely modify critical habitat, a Section 7 consultation is triggered. This means that if you're the EPA and you're registering a chemical, you're supposed to look at if the use of that chemical is going to impact endangered species, or in some cases, species that share a habitat that those endangered species might depend on. If you are the Army Corps of Engineers and you're building a dam, you're supposed to check for endangered species impacts. If you're the Federal Aviation Administration opening up a new flight path, you're supposed to look at endangered species impacts. All of that falls under Section 7, so it's not just an EPA thing. 
And this is where the two laws get very, very different. FIFRA, like we talked about earlier, works more like a scale. It, be, it weighs the cost versus the benefits of a chemical, whereas the ESA is more like this baseball backstop. It's supposed to be there to make sure that species have a foundation. There are pretty much inalienable protections for those species to prevent them from going extinct. So the ESA is built around the idea that there are things that absolutely need to happen, not necessarily no matter what, but with a lot of force behind them, whereas FIFRA is designed to say, there's some good, there's some bad, let's see where it comes out in the end. So when a Section 7 consultation is triggered, that's a, that's a real fun thing to say, um, they first start with a process called informal consultation, which is the government's way of saying, let's meet for coffee and see if you think that there's any endangered species that are gonna be affected by this action. If they think that there might be, they'll go into review, which is where they look at the chemical and they say, where's it gonna be used? How is it gonna be used? What species do you think are gonna be affected? Then they go into a determination where there is typically a years long process of collecting data, running models, looking for wild information from the, the species and where they range. That goes into a formal consultation. And then finally, a biological opinion. A biological opinion, a biop as we call it, is the way that a, an agency doing a consultation will say, here's exactly what we think you need to do to make sure that endangered species are affected as little as possible by the action that you are taking. It's a recommendation, it does not have the force of law, it simply informs what that agency should do based on the expert opinion of the Fish and Wildlife Service. However, again, the reason why I'm here talking to you today is that according to the EPA itself, this is in a document that they released two years ago, you don't have to really, uh, read this whole thing, but of the 12,000 plus chemicals that the EPA currently has registered on the market, the agency has met ESA consultation um, obligations for less than 5% of all the chemicals that are currently registered. That's for a wide variety of different reasons, but what this boils down to say is that most of the chemicals that we are using in our everyday life or the other pest control measures that the government has already approved, so that's not on anybody's shoulders in here, have not gone through the Endangered Species Act process, which means they are way behind on these consultations <laughs> and they need to figure out a way to catch up. So what's been happening is different groups have been using the Endangered Species Act as a way to say, you haven't met your obligations as an agency, EPA. You need to do something different to make sure that we're not negatively uh, impacting threatened or endangered species. And also, when I say endangered species, you know, we typically think of eagles and whales and stuff, but this also goes all the way down to plants, endangered fungi, endangered marine life. There's a lot of stuff that falls under that. There was a chemical called sulfoxiflor. This was five years ago. And basically what happened is sulfoxiflor was approved for new uses, so things that weren't previously on the label, but the EPA did not put it through the formal registration process. They never consulted with the Fish and Wildlife Service to talk about <coughs> endangered species impacts. It was simply put on the market. They got sued and the result was a new comment period that was opened within 180 days, which is really, really fast for government regulation. And just to tell you about the weight of what we're talking about, one, this is just a gorgeous picture of a vulture. I love vultures. But I'm going to read this quote. When an agency deliberately ignores Congress's legislative command, it undermines the will of the people and ultimately our constitutional structure of government. That is spicy stuff, right? This is a single insecticide that had a new use approved without going through the formal process. And this is what the judge said in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals case. It undermines the will of the people. It undermines the Constitution. So EPA, understandably, said, wow, we really need to get our stuff together. They started losing all of these different lawsuits. I'll show you the full chart here in a second. 
But what they did was release a work plan. In 2022, they said, okay, we've got 12,000 chemicals, all of which need to go through this process. We don't have the time, the people, the energy to go through this. We're tired of getting sued. We don't want um, the chemical registrants to have this uncertainty about what they'll be able to market, what they won't, what our people out in the field will be able to use. So they started to develop specific plans of action to meet all of these different legal deadlines. This is the list of chemicals that do not have ESA consultations done on them. Uh, over here, this is on the left side, kind of towards the bottom. You can see we've got the ones that I'm here to talk about, rodenticides, difasinone, difenicum, bromethylen, uh, colocalciferol. Gotta tell you, after I started this job, I got really, really good at Scrabble because there's a lot of <laughs> really long, really complicated words and I just, I really impress people now at Scrabble, it's great. But these are just the chemicals that have a specific legal obligation deadline to be met. This is not speaking of the thousands of other chemicals that EPA still has to make its way through. So they released an update to their work plan where they said rather than going chemical by chemical and species by species, because that's gonna take forever, we're gonna start doing things in buckets. We're gonna start doing it in batches to say, if you're an herbicide and you roughly work in this method of action, here's some draft mitigations we can do. If you're a rodenticide and you roughly work this way, here's a starting list of how we can meet our obligations. They released a pilot program, which I'll talk about in a moment. They're gonna do these national rodenticide, herbicide, and insecticide strategies, which are hundreds, if not thousands of pages long that talk about if you are an insecticide and you are systemic and you're organophosphorus, here's what you need to work, uh, watch out for as you're moving through. And the work plan is meant to be a stopgap until full ESA consultations can be done. So this is not the end all be all. Um, if you hear things being you know, made a big deal about these, this is just meant to be a, here's what we're gonna do in the meantime. So talking specifically about the rodenticide side of things, the, when they did their national rodenticide strategy, that was the first one they did because it had the fewest total active ingredients there. Uh, there were 11 rodenticides in that document. Seven of them uh, that were all anticoagulants already had some type of mitigation uh, placed on them in terms of endangered species. And the last time that EPA took a really big swing was in 2008 with their uh, risk management decision, or sorry, risk mitigation decision, RMD. They did it on 10 out of the 11 ingredients. Strychnine was the only one that didn't get addressed there. And they had an open comment period on this that closed on February 13th of 2023. So what came out of that was the proposed interim decision, they call it a PID, and it announced some mitigations for these 11 rodenticides. And again, these do not have the force of law. These are suggestions. It was then open to another comment period where we could weigh in as you know, a bird group, as a pest group, whomever you are to say, here's what I think of them, here's how it's gonna affect me at the end of the day. This is all the different chemicals that were in there. So we've got our FGARs, our SGARs, and then the non-anticoagulants. Uh, they were all included in this very lengthy document. And here were the key takeaways from EPA's proposed interim decision. So this is really what's driving all the new mitigations that they're thinking about imposing, all the potential label changes that could be there. Number one, rodents are a public health risk. They come out swinging the first page and that's what they say. They don't try to bury that or hide that. They want to make sure that that is still at the forefront of what they are weighing. So that's FIFRA, right? The cost versus benefit analysis. This is saying rodents are very much a public health risk. The second one is that the 2008 risk mitigation decision, the measures in there have to be taken further. Almost all incidents occurring due to rodenticide exposure are the result of label directions to keep bait away from children, pets, and non-target wildlife not being followed. This is something that really doesn't apply to anybody in this room. You all know what you're doing. You're very well educated in this. You're certified in this. This is the people that are buying it at hardware stores, putting it in their homes, in their gardens, in their businesses, whatever it might be. And then there's a lot of exposure that is still happening. The 2008 RMD was supposed to fix all of this, and it really had very little impact. 
The third key takeaway that they had were that SGARs are riskier than FGARs. Is that news to anybody? No, right? We all knew that, but EPA put that in there. They said higher secondary exposures happen with FGARs, and they, or sorry, with SGARs, and they stay in tissue much longer, which means there's a greater risk of secondary exposure to uh, mice, rats, cats, dogs, you name it, anything that falls under there. And then the fourth one is that the vast majority of poisoning incidents are not reported. And that's the big thing to remember is, we, you know, our decisions can only be as good as our data. However, in the case of rodenticides, EPA concedes that most accidental poisonings that occur are not reported. They're not in the data sets that EPA collects. So it makes it a little bit harder to make decisions just saying, hey, this is exactly what we're looking at. This is the exact number of accidental poisonings that happen. That's what we can use to drive our decisions. As a result, they know that to make sure that they are protecting human health, that's really what's driving this whole thing is human health, they need to be a little more overly conservative. So again, this, is, this was all proposed, it's not finalized. These were the major changes that they proposed. This is from a federal level, this would then trickle down. All SGARs will be moved to RUP status, restricted use status. All FGARs sold in quantities greater than or equal to four pounds will be RUPs. And EPA was very, very clear in their first draft. They said, we do not want to make all first generation anticoagulants restricted use status. A lot of groups were pushing for that. I'm not here to advocate um, my you know, organization specific position on this. If you want to see where we fell on it, it's public record, our comments are online. And I invite you to do so. I'm also happy to talk about it afterwards. Um, but EPA said, we do not want to make all FGARs RUPs. We don't think that that'll solve the problem. They did say that if, it is, if you're buying it in quantities of four pounds or more, then it should be restricted use status. And again, that's to cut down on the amount of accidental poisonings in people, children, pets, you name it. I don't mean to say the children aren't people, but they're, you know, little people. Um, increased PPE requirements. Consumer size FGARs must be made in ready to use disposable bait stations only. So rather than buying a bunch of refillable uh, rodenticides that you could put in, their suggestion was that you get something that's in basically a single use bait station only to cut down on the risk of tampering or accidental exposure. Application method prohibitions for chlorofacinone and difacinone, we'll get into that in a moment. Uh, limitations on broadcast applications of FGARs, that's mostly for the agricultural sector. They updated Bulletins Live 2 language. Is any, everyone in here familiar with Bulletins Live and what that is? Has anyone heard of Bulletins Live? No? Interesting. We had a couple people raise their hand. So Bulletins Live, this is a little more relevant for people that are working in huge open areas, so a lot of agriculture. Um, a lot of storage facilities. Bulletins Live is a program that the EPA runs where you open up the label to a chemical. You have, might have to do it virtually since a lot of them are very long. You go to this website, Bulletins Live 2. You type in the zip code where you are. You can even do the geographical coordinates. And it tells you if you are within the range of an endangered species. And if you are, if you're gonna be applying within that species range, there might be additional mitigations that you have to do. It's all online, um, it's all ready to go on a smartphone because that's something very accessible to everyone at this point. It's a great way to make sure that you are not endangering endangered wildlife, basically. I don't mean you, I mean, you know, you. Uh, Post-application follow-up, so carcass searches, collection, and disposal, mostly applying to FGARs, basically saying if you put out rodenticides, you have to go back and check if there's anything dead a couple days later especially with um, FGARs because they take multiple exposures to really work in most cases. The rodents can wander away. This is a very interesting suggestion because it would cut down on the amount of wildlife that's being exposed. And post-application follow-up, so basically clean enough any kicked out bait, spilled bait, things like that. And then there's also new reporting requirements. So I talked earlier about the EPA pilot program um, and the rodenticide PID that they released. 
And basically, here's what they decided to do. They said, we don't have time to go through every single endangered species to figure out how rodenticides might affect them. So instead, we're gonna pick three representative species and use that to make a rough outline of what we can do to mitigate rodenticide impacts. We're gonna pick one species that would itself potentially eat a rodenticide, because it's a rodent. So they went with this cute little guy, the Stevens kangaroo rat. We're gonna pick one species that is not a rodent, so not a target of use, but might accidentally ingest some, which is the Atwater's prairie chicken. And then we're gonna pick one that is a secondary consumer. So an animal that eats an animal that eats a rodenticide and could be exposed that way. This was their way of saying, after this, any animal that we get that's endangered, okay, we can say you are an endangered lizard, this endangered lizard eats mice, so we need to see what we did for the California condor, because that's an animal that eats an animal that eats an FGAR. If it's an endangered uh, bird, okay, so you're a bird, you might go around, eat some pellets, accidentally ingest some rodenticide. We're gonna see what we propose for the Atwater's prairie chicken, and that's what we might do for you, or at least that's our jump off point. Is that making sense? Everybody good on that? Cool. So what they did was they worked through all 11 chemicals. They looked at them for these three different species. LAA is likely to adversely affect. NLAA is not likely to adversely affect. And basically, they went through, they used modeling, they used wild data, they said, where are these chemicals being used? How likely is it that these species are going to be exposed? And if they are, is it going to be in a great enough quantity that we are gonna see a species level impact, that the entire species could be put at risk from the use of this chemical? So starting with the condor, what they came up with was saying you can't do broadcast application of chlorofacinone and difacinone within or near their range, mandatory carcass searches within their range, and no use of warfarin for feral hog control. So this is not saying across the entire country we're gonna do this. They're saying to protect California condors within the range, within these yellow areas that you see here, these are the things that we suggest you do to cut down on their risk. For the Atwater's prairie chicken, which has a very, very small range, they said we're worried about what chlorofacinone can do to birds. We all know that it has, or sorry, not chlorofacinone, uh, but some of them have a very high mortality rate in birds. Uh, but chlorofacinone is heavily used in Atwater prairie chicken territory. So they said we are going to prohibit broadcast uses in grassland pasture and right away within pesticide sensitive areas. That's their way of saying wherever you find the chickens, here's some things that we suggest you not do. And you can see this little teeny tiny area, the green area down at the bottom is where uh, they, these mitigations would go into effect. And then for the Stevens kangaroo rat, they said, can anybody come up with a bait station that lets in our target rodent, but lets out a Stevens kangaroo rat or doesn't allow a Stevens kangaroo rat to get in? Please, dear God, we have no idea somebody come up with something is more or less what they wrote in the thing. Um, and unless you're gonna pay an intern to sit there with a hammer and kill rats and not Stevens kangaroo rats, I don't know how you do that, but I've seen some really amazing technology here at this conference, so maybe someone will come up with something. Uh, they prohibit broadcast applications of FGARs in range areas and prohibit burrow bait applications in range. So people see these, they get really freaked out because they say, well, that's a rat. There's rats that we're targeting. This is something that's really going to affect me. You know, am I going to be able to use this? Maybe I should write in, tell Fish and Wildlife not to do these things. Here's the area that we're talking about. This is the, um, the state of California. That little teeny tiny blue area is the only place where these additional mitigations would apply. And within that, it's even since been restricted to just the areas that we currently find Stevens kangaroo rats. Not even everywhere they could be, just everywhere that, they know, that we know they are. So that's the only place that these mitigations are affecting. After that, EPA did their next round, which is where they say, okay, we're now gonna go through and do our biological evaluation. We are gonna look at all endangered species, figure out which ones might be affected by current uses of rodenticides, and then we are going to put out recommendations to fix that. This is meant to build upon what they already did in that pilot study that we just talked about, that long list that I had. This is what has been introduced. Um, 
EPA made it very clear that these recommendations, should they be adopted, will supersede any of the previous um, recommendations. So number one is they said for all endangered species, bait stations cannot be placed within five feet of man-made structures in areas with endangered mammals that could enter. So it's saying if there's like an endangered elk, you're fine. You don't need to worry about it because an elk's not gonna wander into a bait station. But if it's a small mammal, then uh, that's something that you need to worry about. You need to not um, apply pestic rodenticides rather specifically to water with an exemption of islands for island conservation because rodenticides are often used to get rid of mice and rats on uh, or within island ecosystems. Mandatory carcass searches and disposals for eschars applied in structural sites in endangered species range and then some temporal restrictions, which is saying if it's breeding season, if it's migration season and a species might be found there, we're gonna put some restrictions on some chemicals just to protect them. And again, this is where it gets tricky because now they're balancing FIFRA, which says we need to look at the cost benefits versus the Endangered Species Act, which is there to basically save species that uh, fall under it. Number five, cover burrow holes after applications made in fields for species that could live in closed burrow systems, which is meant to cut down on uh, you know, rodents that could be exposed. That one's real technical. Uh, we don't need to get into that one. Monitor open burrows for dead animals after below ground and in burrow applications and updated labels if the biological opinion needs to be changed. This is EPA's way of saying, if we find out more stuff later on, we reserve the right to go back and still change that label to make sure that species are protected as much as they can be from these chemicals. And again, this only applies to ESA listed species and the ranges that they are currently in. Now the ESA is very, very divisive. Some people look at the Endangered Species Act and say that it's, you know, it's killing private industry. Some people say it's, it doesn't go far enough. Usually people fall somewhere within that range. The end of the day is that the Endangered Species Act works. 99% of the species which are listed on it do not go extinct. You will hardly find another law in the United States that has that level of success to it. I would also compare it to our uh, neighbors up north, their equivalent is the, um, the PMRA. I can't remember what the acronym is, but basically the Canadians wait until there's like five individuals left of a species and then say, okay, let's pour a bunch of money into it. Let's see what happens. And almost every time the species winds up going extinct. They don't like it either. Their biologists and their legislators are working hard to change that. But in the US, the Endangered Species Act works really well. And why it's so important to think about this entire process is because basically for 40 years, the EPA was not doing its congressionally mandated job. So if you feel like you're hearing a lot more about endangered species requirements or the EPA is doing so much more than it ever has before, why are they coming down hard on us? It's because for 40 years, as has been proved in over 65 different court cases at this point, they neglected their duties to do full consultations and look at all impacts of different chemicals. This might be coming across as harsh. I'm not wanting to come across as blaming anybody here or saying it's your fault, you're killing species. Not at all. I'm just saying this is government agencies now being held to do their job. And this is a great way for us to help save endangered species and also put the protections in place that they need. However, this entire process, everything that I have said to you today is mostly driven by the fact that the last time EPA tried to change up rodenticide labels, it didn't work well enough. We still saw extremely high levels of accidental poisoning in people and in pets. That's mostly what's driving all of these decisions. And a lot of that doesn't apply to professionals like yourself, but a lot of these changes are designed to help keep people and pets and especially wildlife from becoming sick or imperiled. So I go back to, is this needed? Is this something that we need to do? Rodenticides, as we know, accidentally make their way up the food chain quite a bit. We see impacts and you know, the, the things we hear about on the news, cougars, bobcats, certainly birds of prey, but even sea turtles. There's a high level of rodenticide exposure in sea turtles in the Gulf of Mexico. Anticoagulant rodenticide exposure and toxicosis in bald eagles and golden eagles, 
this study was done and found that 82% of eagles in the United States have some level of rodenticide in them. Um, most of them are sublethal levels. However, the tricky thing with rodenticides, just because of the way that they're designed to work, they do their job very, very well, is it can then contribute to those species out in their everyday life. So in birds like eagles and hawks that fly accidentally into wind turbines and power lines, when they do the uh, autopsies, or in an animal it's called a necropsy rather, on them, they're finding that most of those species have elevated levels of rodenticide in them. That means, and there's other stuff too, it can be lead sometimes as well. But what they think happens is that, you know, these animals are getting exposed to small amounts and then it's impacting their ability to navigate, to fly, to uh, find prey adequately, to get out of the way when something's coming at them. Changing just a little teeny tiny bit of their natural reactions is going to have dire consequences as we keep changing their landscape. In songbirds like this uh, warbler here on the right, there is a huge problem with window collisions and impairment of senses from accidental exposure to chemicals is something that does impact them. It makes it harder for them to fly. It makes it harder for them to see what's right in front of them. So there are very much real world applications of what's happening here with rodenticides. But my message to you is not let's get rid of all chemicals. It's not let's get rid of rodenticides because you know they're hurting wildlife and things like that. You see every day, far more than I ever will, the positive impact that pest control has, the people that it keeps safe, the industries that it helps protect, the fact that it lets clean water come out of my tap. I'm so, so grateful for that. But what we also need to remember is that we are changing our environment. We share it with these absolutely incredible animals, these incredible plants, these incredible fungi. And there is a way that we can meet all of our different goals. And that's by working together and not being overly reactionary at what an agency is doing or what industry is doing. We have to be able to find the middle ground. And that's what EPA is really trying hard to do now through this process is say, how do we provide greater certainty to our applicators? How do we provide greater certainty to chemical registrants? But how do we protect people and wildlife? It's the Environmental Protection Agency, and they're finally being held to that standard and made to do their job. So my job mostly is reading through hundreds of thousands of pages sometimes of federal documents to figure out what the heck is going on and then try to translate that out and uh, basically make it stronger for birds and better for people too. So this is what EPA is trying to do, like I said, provide tools, protect species, and protect people. And next up, we'll be getting their final decision, which is where they say, we've heard everything everyone has to say, here's what we are deciding to do at the end of it. So that is the end of my time, and I'm now going to yield over to, uh, we will have time for questions at the, the very end for both of us is how we're gonna do it. But uh, I will now hand it over to the wonderful, the fabulous, the Meryl Streep of rodentology himself, Dr. Bobby Corrigan. Okay, good morning everybody. Um, while we're setting up here, Happy New Year's probably appropriate, right? We're just a couple of days into this and sometimes we feel like this, right? Of constantly, at least I do, writing my, uh, all my notes to reflect 2024. So um, let me make sure I have the right, I've got two of them here. Oh, all right, we got this one down here, three of them. So my job um, is this topic, to um, follow through with uh, Hardy's message. Um, and I, I think you all know me, but just in case, I'm going to be coming from you, of course, from the PMP perspective. The everyday, out on the route perspective, right? And I'm still, as a consultant, I'm out in the field a lot. I'm out in the field dealing with rats and cities. I'm out in the field dealing with mice in schools and mice in office buildings. So that's where I like to be. That's my whole life's where I like to be, is out in the field for the most part, when it can be. Tomorrow at this time, I'll be back in lower Manhattan, New York City, and in the afternoon, I'll be out in the field with a whole team. 
And of course, for denicides and rodenticide applications, especially in cities like New York, are a major player. But we also have parks with hawks. We have sightings of eagles in New York. We have a favorite owl in New York right now. We're generating all kinds of clubs just to go see this one owl. So it's a big issue, as already mentioned. You know, this is, you know, this whole talk about, and as I'm out doing my survey work and work with my teams, and people ask us, what are you doing? We go, well, we're working on rodent surveys. And there's black bait stations throughout New York City, by the thousands. And so right away, people, we get different sides of it. You gotta get rid of these rats, it's ridiculous, it's, it's getting out of hand. Other people say, yeah, but get rid of the rats, but stop using these poisons. So, as Hardy mentioned, we're at somewhat this decision point this year. And history is fascinating to see how we got here and the regulations and, and so forth. But I'm coming again from the perspective of, okay, we're gonna go out, we're gonna do a rodent job, get rid of some rats, get rid of some mice, take care of business, protect public health, protect properties. But how does it all shake out in terms of where are we going? What's the threat to where we're going? What's the threat to the wildlife where we're going? And so forth. All right, so I do want to say thanks to the people. Every year this goes on, I've been a big part of, this is a big part of my life. I was part of this for 16 years, behind the, behind the scenes. A lot of work goes into getting this conference launched. Right, and so these folks here are just incredible. Carrie Campbell and Holly Fletcher Timmons in particular, amazing women. How many things they get done and get it done well and get it done so that this can flow seamlessly. And then the whole team behind them, right? And the planning committee. So it's an honor always to be invited here and I do want to express that thanks. So since I'm coming to you from New York, going back to New York, I just want to share with you for a second New York City. Um, this is where I work, literally. I'll be there, this, like I just mentioned, tomorrow morning at this time, I'll be in the top of that brown building. Our office is right at the top, and right to the right, if you will, of this screen is the Hudson River. And to the left is the Statue of Liberty. We're right on the tip. We're right at the, the World Trade Center, and the whole scene there, which is now a memorial. And that is what's called, that strange looking building, if you will, is called the Oculus. Down below is this memorial, museum, and all kinds of things attributed to 9-11. So that's where I'll be, and I can tell you from knowing, experience, that we had rats at the top of the Freedom Tower before it was finished, right across the street. The rodent pressure in New York City is among the highest of any place in the world. And I can tell you from experience of just working in this area, every single building you see in this picture has mice. The house mouse is the second most successful mammal on planet Earth. So of course we need tools to control these rodents. Without a doubt we need these tools. But the question is, what modifications to these tools as Hardy mentioned, we're gonna to have to make, right? So, this is a solar trash can, a compact trash when you put it in, and it works, you know, it has a little compact inside, it's called the big belly, it can take 30% more trash as you put it in there. You'll notice it says a little litter can lead to big problems, and there's a silhouette of a rat there. My question when they started putting these out, I'm like, yeah, well, what about big litter? What does that lead to? Because in New York City, and we're finally changing, it only took 75 years, but we're finally changing that, it's not acceptable to put out trash in plastic bags all night long, because you'll feed rats by the millions which we have. And then people say, you need to get rid of these rats. So notice the catch bay. We call those catch basins in New York City. They lead down to the sewer line, of course. The water flows down. In New York City, we have mostly what's called combined sewer systems meaning the rainwater goes down and the wastewater goes down from the toilet bowls or no laterals into the same system. It's an old city. And you probably know the other name for the Noi rat is the sewer rat. 
Exactly. If you go to Paris, it's the sewer rat. If you go to Rome, sewer rat. The point is, the Noi rat from Mongolia, that's where it originated, that brain says, dig into the earth for your habitat. Now, the roof rat's brain says, go up into trees for your habitat. So if you're a rat in any of the cities, including here in the Midwest, in Chicago and Cleveland and, and all around Louisville and so forth, that rat, that rat right there, that silhouette, their brain says, get down into the earth. Geotropic positive. So let's take a look at this catch basin here. And um, Anthony, if you're back there, if you can trigger that, get that started. There's a short video here. We were just testing to, to work. Keep an eye on this catch basin. There's nobody there yet. Isn't this like whack-a-mole? <laughs> There's mom, by the way. Mom just put her head up. Everybody else is part of the family unit. That's one family of rats. But I've worked in those sewers, and I can tell you, this is the tip of the rat burk. That's what this is. I've been in those sewers. I started out as a pest control technician. My first job was these sewers. New guy gets the great job, right? So I used to go down and, and take care of business down there. So here's another. This is New York City. Busy, busy street, by the way. Here's a rat that's, that's kind of been um, surprised, if you will. Someone stomps their foot. And, and we'll trigger this one also. All right, thank you. Thanks, Anthony. All right, so let's, let's get this rat moving. Stomp the foot. Now, you know what's amazing, you guys, is if you just clocked that, it would come in at four seconds. The house mouse moves at seven feet per second. And the reason I'm stressing this, I'm going to come back to this, because it ties into what Hardy just said. You know, nature's a really well-oiled machine. And to mess with that oil machine, whether or not they're going to fly correctly or, or avoid the last minute wire or something like this, is critical. So we all know this guy, and this is not a session. I'm not doing biology behavior rodents here. I've stood at this podium many times and have done that, right? But this is our Noe rat. We have the roof rat. We have Noe rat. We have the house mouse. Again, incredible successful mammals. No surprise to anybody. A major part of the revenue generated in this pest control industry these days is rodents. And what's more, is if you maintain any resemblance of attention to the rodent populations, they're up around the world. Globally. As a consultant, I travel internationally. I will tell you, cities call me, can you come to our city? Can you work with us, set up a plan? We've never had these kinds of problems before. So rodentology right now is a very, very hot science. For many, many years, the entomologists got all the attention. So these animals, we have to focus on this, this comment, you know, nature is a well-oiled machine of millions of years that works on a millisecond precision. Those are critical words. Every single word weighs heavy here. Milliseconds and very precise. And with rodents, that's no different. So here's another short vid. And this is this this nice, very nice house had a mouse problem. They hired the pest professional, was really good in exclusion, to exclude the mice from the house. And by the way, all the time I hear, well, you can't keep mice out of a house. They need any little tiny cracker. Yes, you can, if you know what you're doing. But it's far beyond stuffing some steel well into a hole and saying, okay, I'm doing some exclusion. And it's definitely not about spraying some foam into a hole and calling that exclusion. It's the worst thing you could do. But let's take a look. A mouse has been excluded out of here. You know, he's going to come back. He's going to make a presence here in a second. He's going to come back and try. He's like, hey, I want to get back in. Here he comes. This is during the night. There's his eyes. You can see.
millisecond precision. See how fast that went down? That's their lives. Night after night, night after night, is they, once they lay down a pheromone trail, and the memory, spatial memory of how to get there back and forth after many, many thousands of visits, say in the course of a month, of going out, getting some resources, not staying out visible, and not staying out so they're picked off by a hawk or an owl or a coyote or a fox or a bobcat, they need to work like this. They're designed as a prey species that everybody wants to eat for a quick hit of protein. They're designed to get this job done quickly. Get out, get what you need, get back, avoid getting killed because everybody wants to eat you. And, and so if we just look at another example, what you're about to see here is, you know, these two mice are going to encounter each other. One was already in the cage feeding, without having setting off the cage, they're feeding the guy, you can see the mouse in the background there, with the, the eyes, he's up on the wall of the trap. This other mouse comes along like, oh, maybe you're in my territory. Or maybe something else, don't know. But what I want you to watch in this very fast, split second, millisecond thing, is first watch the mouse on the front end's tail. When the house mouse gets agitated for aggression, they rattle their tails. And the more they're agitated, especially the dominant males will do this, and the more they're agitated, that tail's like just going crazy. Now in this one, they pretty much smell each other, see each other like, okay, it's, it's about to happen, it's gonna go down. And the mouse in the background is kind of caught back there. It could be dangerous for him. He's going to have to have a pretty good strategy. But let's watch. Watch the tail. Now, if we, and we're not going to do this because of time, you guys, but if we went frame by frame on this, which is what I've done, frame by frame, millisecond frame, you will see that mouse that was in the cage make this evasive maneuver, almost like boxers, you know, with the duck and weave thing. Makes an evasive mover in such a split millisecond to go over the back of that other mouse by going up the cage, making a gymnastic move, turning around, coming back down, and the other mouse like, whoop, where is he? What happened? Evasive. Gets to live another day. Then we have this. So you're about to see this little experiment where capture the mice inside and hey, what happens? Some people say, we want you to release the animal you caught live trapped here on the same property there was caught. It makes a lot of sense, right? But that's actually out there in some of the states. Release at point of capture. Oh, excellent. So that's what's gonna happen here. Right, this mouse, there's a mouse that's good in that cage, he's about to be released by this pest professional. We're gonna open up the door and we're gonna watch this mouse. He was in the house, he's just right in the front yard. So he's released back onto the property of which he was captured. Now something happened in there that was so quick you'd miss it. And that is, and if we, could, if we could go back, Anthony, can you take me back on this for a second? So let's watch this mouse. I want you to watch where he, for a second he pauses at one spot as he hits the house. Boom. Do you see that? Why is that important? Because mice and rats, have our properties mapped out with pheromones and spatial memories, by the time we get involved, they've got it all done. Inside, outside, perimeters, every little spot, where's the spot to tell you, make a quick left here, and in a millisecond, you're back in the hole that nobody can see. Precision. So sometimes, you know, when I was in grad school and I was studying rodents, I thought, you know, and I remember on my route telling all my customers, look, these are varmints. They're just varmints and everything's instinct. And, and you know, I'm going to put out some traps in your basement they're along the wall because they can't see very well and they have to touch the wall to get around and they're just doing everything by instinct. Ridiculous, what I told people for three years. But, we didn't have that science either back then. So I don't feel necessarily guilty about it other than I wish I did more reading. 
because it was published back then, but I wasn't guided to where to read about it. But anyway, they're far from just varmints with instinct that run along walls. And then we have this piece. And now we're going to tie it together as to this millisecond precision world of predator prey. And so another precise animal, right? You better believe it. So their job is to be able to catch these animals with millisecond like that mouse jumping over the back in the cage of the other, the other mouse darting and disappearing in a blink. That's how good these animals have to be if they want to have dinner. Because those animals, they've learned over the millions that these things move fast. And I've got to come in quiet. I've got to come in sneaky. I've got to come in out of the dark. I have to have the effect of the surprise. And I have to get dinner. And this is house mouse. Now, they're not always successful. Quite a few times they miss. It's a capture rate. All kinds of studies done on the different species and predator-prey relationships and which prey, what's the capture rate for that prey and so forth. It's really cool reading. So that mouse is going to do its thing as best it can, just like you saw it, to precise move, milliseconds. And that owl better have its act together, both behaviorally, through experience, and physiologically, through healthy body. Because there's no room, just as you heard Hardy say, there's no real room to say, well, look, you know, a little bit of redenticide, yeah, they've got it in the system, and yeah, we are, we've seen the studies, and everybody said, but you know, we've read studies that ain't killing them. Oh. So, <laughs> ain't killing them, but maybe they're eating 40% less, and that means less clutch, less eggs, less maneuverability for those wires. Whatever it means is who wants to be told you're going to be at 40% less physiologically than when you are right now sitting here. But you're not going to die from it. So here we are at this, this meeting. You know, we have a two-hour session today, Hardy and I, a two-hour session. You think about it, it's the Purdue University Conference, and we have all kinds of business to do and learn about all new techniques and technology and What's, what's new in the product experts here and so forth and so on? Why would the planning committee put two hours on this? Because it's a big deal. Of course it's a big deal. This is huge when you consider the rodent populations around the world are exploding, and yet some people feel like, well, some of our tools are going to be taken away from us. How does that work? So. I'm not reading. You're not to read this. Don't read it. I just wanted to make sure you saw that, those words in the middle, the important words by a very famous expert. The chemicals can stay lodged in animal tissue for months, pose an eco ecological menace. That pretty much sums it up with the second generation in particular of anticoagulants. So these second generations and the environment, you know, and I've done this, it took me three years to get through it. I went back to school a couple of years ago, so to speak, because I really didn't have a grasp. I was like, Let's, is this incidental? Is this hawk thing and this owl thing? And I, I see that even mountain lions are beginning to show up in the news. Is this just a bunch of greenies going crazy and trying to take away our really important public health for denticides? Is that what's going on here? What? And I myself, I've stood at this podium, as I mentioned in the past, I don't know how many lectures I've given on using rodent baits effectively in my career. But I can say, and I taught here 16 years at rodent control course at Purdue University, it's been hundreds. So, but now, if you go and you do the same back to school thing of rodenticides in the environment, I'm just going to show you a little tiny piece of it, but it's irrefutable. This is not a debate anymore. It's no debate. So we have to, as an industry, as professionals, that we are about public health, but public health includes the environment. It doesn't just include our houses. Healthy environment is healthy life. 
in many, many different ways. So great tools, and we need tools, and we need redenticides. So nobody, especially I'm not standing up saying, you know, we got rid of it. We got to get rid of these redenticides. There's absolutely no doubt about it. It's just like Hardy said, we have to meet in a smart, compromised position where we can keep up public health tools without some of the damage that is showing up all over, right? So here's, here's the list. And again, as Hardy mentioned, but it's not just the birds. It's not just the hawks and the owls and the eagles. And by the way, eagles now are showing up periodically. The bald eagle. So now people are like, holy cow, remember DDT? That was probably the, the single three legs words that took down. DDT was, you know, eagle. So non-threatening small mammals, of which there's a long, long list of mammals, small mammals being affected by these redenticides, most of which are critical for the eco web. Predators, again, as Hardy mentioned, fox, coyote, bobcats, raccoons, skunks, weasels, reptiles, snakes, turtles, talking about the green turtles, fish, other aquatic organisms. The last one's kind of a kicker and is cooking right now, quite honestly, is now we're finding them in our food, particularly poultry and swine. You better believe right now, USDA and FDA are like all over this. And again, suppose someone said, here's uh, some eggs and bacon this morning for your breakfast. And listen, it's not going to hurt you, but I, we just thought it's fair to inform you there's some rodent poison in that in very small dosages. Oh, that's OK, fine. Of course it's not. And so I'm out, and as much as I'm in New York City, I also work with farms. I work with some of the largest farm organizations in the United States, if not the largest. And farmers, in particular, sometimes, you know, it's, it's a different culture with pesticide applications on some farms. Like, this is my farm, I own this farm, I work this farm, I know what I'm doing this farm, and it'll be certified, pesticide certified in category one, category 1A. One, one of the things I wrote TPA in the pit is I, listen, of all things that we need to do, we better put in a special category for farmers and just for denticide applications. Because just having a 1A is just so general, it's not ever going to touch this. So this is the issue, graphically speaking, of course, is what's in the rodent ends up in the bird, in this case, bird, but we could put a bobcat up here. So lots of press, you know, uh, you know, and if you go digging right now, if you just get into Google and you put rodenticides and wildlife, you're going to have days of reading. Some of it's well done, some of it's well written, some of it just like anything, some of it's bad journalism, some of it's everything in the middle. So you have to be careful with what you get online these days. That's for everything. But if you really want the bottom line, you have to go to a referee journal. And you don't have to be a scientist and say, oh, OK, I'm not sure about these fancy dancy formal journals, and I can't get through all those statistics, and some of these formula talking about is p equals 0 0.05, and all these graphs, I'm, that's not my thing. You don't, you don't even need to go there. But if you go to the referee journal and just read the abstract, even just that, you can get a pretty good picture. Now, if it's a referee journal, it is what it says. It's gone through a referee process of other scientists. It's been checked for statistics. You know, unless it's a really very low impact journal, but it's gone through a process of is this good science or is it junk science? Junk science doesn't get published, hopefully, at any referee journal. Right? So, you know, it's it's the kinds of things that is the issue. That rat's about to go through some stuff today. <laughs> so, and again, I'm not taking you through this, but I wanted to just show you, you know, is quality, quality science information being published all across the spectrums. This happens to be, you know, conservation letter, raptors and anticoagulant rodenticides. The, way, the one I put up here in particular is for two reasons. One, if you see all the blue links, those are all the global publications from different countries and areas 
putting their work into, well, here's what we're finding in our area for rodenticides and, and wildlife, not just raptors, by the way. And if you go to the back of this paper, and you can download this paper with free access, if you go to the back of this paper, you will see that there's hundreds of well-cited research papers just on this subject. And you have to step away and you know, say, holy cow, you know, there's this much science going down on just this topic of which I use rodenticides every, maybe every single day as a PMP? Yep. So, and again, I'm not trying to, who, I would never take you through this reading. And the reason I even put it up, this is out of my Malice book that's gonna be coming out, you know, this year, next year, I'm not sure, you know. But it, it's, it's a case of, the references go on and on, and the reason I show this particular list is if you do read this, you will see that it goes everything from farm to industry, everything from fish to reptiles to different birds, including songbirds, by the way. People saying, how are songbirds getting into this material? Well, songbirds, they need protein too, and a lot of times what they'll do is they'll trail ants leaving a bait station, feeding on a base. Every, every one of us in this room know about that, where ants come in and they eat, just rip our baits, especially the ones with oil in them, the, the soft baits, and the songbirds will just peck right in that trail to get their protein. So, bottom line, everybody, quite frankly, and I'm, I'm in the thick of this right here, we didn't see this coming. This is not something that we had far, far advanced notice, although this is nothing new either anymore. And to give credit to a couple of people, a couple of scientists, back in the 60s, there were scientists saying, well, we don't think this chemistry should go forth in the 60s. And then there were a couple of stronger voices in the 70s saying, stop. And by the time the second generation hit and released by the early 80s, we had several scientists saying, this chemistry is going to cause us serious environmental issues. But there are only a few of them. And one of the few was in New York City, who started finding dead hawks and owls early on in New York City and having tests done on them. My own stuff, you know, I'm proud to say these are three publications I've been associated with in, in my career, all three written the chapters on rodents. And, you know, here's my, here's my own paragraph, number four, under my chapter on rodenticide baits out of my own textbook. Contemporary rodenticides present relatively low hazard and poisoning threats to non-targets when used according to label directions. Well, I'm working on the second edition for this, you know, and I can tell you that word is gone, but I did not see this coming. So the word is completely different, and it has to be completely different. We thought we had it covered with this. So did EPA. In fact, right here at Purdue University, when I started on the staff here after graduate school, when I started on the staff, 1980, 81, 82, we were the ones that said, you know, before us with the lab, there were no rods. We said, you know, this bait's being easily picked up out of the bait station, you know, it's a tamper-resistant bait station with lock and key and all the wording and, everything. and the EPA, you know, tamper-resistant, eight criteria and so forth, but the rodents are picking up the bait and just carrying it out. So we worked on that immediately at, here at, at Purdue, and these days, even the rods don't prevent it completely from being carried out, but it's not about being carried out in this issue we're talking about this morning. It's about, it stays in, but once the rodent feeds on it, they go out, and they become prey. That's what it's about. So make no mistake about it, and these are my words, it would be a monumental public health mistake to ban all rodenticides. EPA knows that. As already mentioned, the EPA knows that. Almost everybody knows that. Some people say, well, you shouldn't use those toxicants. I'm like, well, let me tell you, how much do you want to pay for a non-toxic approach to rodent control. We can do it, we can do it. But if you're willing to pay that big bill, let's talk. So nobody's proposing that. That's not on the quote, the table. As Hardy mentioned, this is not on the table at EPA. This is not, again, a big, bad government's gonna take away our tools. It's not that at all. 
but it would also be a monumental environmental mistake to continue along this current path. Notice, I'm talking second generation. I'm not talking over the genocides. Thank goodness. Because that risk is not the same across all the redenocides you saw in Hardy's tables. So, but here's the issue. These redenocides, the second generation anticoagulants, they've gotten away from us, clearly. Globally, every place. They're away from us globally in location. They're away from us in all the animal biomes, as you just saw. They're in the birds, they're in the fish, they're in, they're in the carnivores, they're in the insects. They're away from us. The drift has been incredible in terms of size that we didn't see coming. So it, it's a case of now to add to the whole thing, we are selling them online to anybody pretty much that wants them. These redenocides were never meant for the lay public, never. They were never invented for that purpose. They were for professionals, every one of us in this room. Decon pretty much started the slide where they put brodifacum, one of the hottest toxic actives, into Decon, sold it on supermarket shelves, and got away with it for a while. Well, agricultural, as I mentioned, so we have online, billions and billions of mishaps are just even being used in backyards where people are throwing it around garden sheds, they're throwing it around any area they want. Oh, yeah, yeah, I read the label, sure, right? Agricultural lacks applications in both crops and li livestock right off the back of the tractor kinds of things. And then we have us. Most people think it's us. They think it's us. That's the big crux of the issue, because we're visible to them in suburbia and urbia. And they, they think, oh, it's these exterminators doing all these problems. We're actually, in my opinion, studying all the data and everything. We come in last. It's not us. But we're going to be tagged with this. So. My opinion has always been, and I know I've, I've said it right at this podium many, many times, these products should never end up in the hands of the lay public. Here we are, you're going to get certification for this session, right? At the end, you're going to barcode, you're going to get the, the you know, barcode thing, you're going to get certification that you were here, you deserve to get your CEUs and so forth, because you were here and hopefully listening and learning all the different sessions. Anybody can walk into that Home Depot and buy anything they want. Anyone can push the Amazon click, and for the most part, some states restrict some things, get anything they want, including tracking powder, restricted use tracking powder, in plenty of places. Click with a click. So this is just an outstanding summary of the issue of the Audubon magazine. Chris Sweeney, I've actually worked with him in the past over the years. He does his homework. He's very detail-oriented. He's a really good journalist. It took him a long time to put this together. But he summarizes it beautifully as you better believe the internet has a very bad rat, problem, rat poison problem. I would, you can download this right off your computer. I would encourage you to do so, please, and, and read it. But here's the kinds of numbers we're dealing with out there. Next year, $5.8 billion, $5 billion on these products. Now, there's maybe some good news within this because I'm going to focus on this in a big way, is this is really mostly about exterior issues with the SCARs, not interior, which is a big deal for us. So I don't know what percentage of this is just for mice indoors. It's probably a chunk. But that's the kind of thing I'm hoping, you know, EPA and others, including the manufacturers, look at as to, okay, what is our responsibility for indoor applications, outdoor applications, making sure people aren't slinging these products out where the, you know, secondary exposure is very, very high. But for one thing's for sure is redenocides are really pushing the market. I mean, really pushing the market. I didn't stage this. This is I see this all the time, and not just New York City. Even though I'm talking about New York City and what have you, it's not just New York City. As a consultant, as I mentioned earlier, I travel all over, and I see these lay applications, and I was like, "Wow, what happened here?" Well, 
I figured I could do it myself. I don't know what the exterminator does. I don't know why we should pay them 68 bucks a month, but I, I can do that. I'm like, no, you can't. Just if you can buy a hammer, it doesn't make you a carpenter, a skilled carpenter. This. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this picture that's it's like super common. Everywhere I go, and I'm willing to bet most of you here, you, yep, seen it, Bobby, been there, done it, yep, all the time, yep. But I see this on farms much more, much more on farms. Oh, it's just some grind, you know, the farmers know, it's just some granules I'm spraying for the rats and mice or every place, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, it's not granules. You can't spread them. It says do not broadcast. Yeah, well. So here's the thing. All of us, this whole picture now that we're involved in, this whole group of how do these rodenticides get globally out there and drift environmentally is because now this whole group is involved. You know, it's the public, it's the farmer, it's us, it's rodenticide manufacturers, you know, but bottom line is all of us, you know, we have no business with this statement. Because if you study the issue, as I mentioned, that is, that's the no business. That we're not going to be able to measure, that Al can't talk to us and say, yeah, you know what, it's my fourth mouse this month, and after, you know, I just feel, you know, like us, we get sick sometimes after we eat some food. I'm not going back to that restaurant. I don't know, but we'll never be able to measure it. Al can't say, I'm just not really up to perfect speed. So you and I, and I'm speaking clearly, but to some degree I feel my job is to try to save, actually save these important tools where we can save them and we certainly can. But it's also our job as professionals to recognize it's our responsibility to not allow this to become something more than a redenticide. They're not animal sides. And so there is things we can do, you know, with all kinds of practices and, and so forth and new technology. And I'm just going to skim through a, a second message here, you know, but the strategy, for example, you know, that Harvey's talking about, that's coming up. I'm holding my breath like, please, let's, you know, there's nothing worse than bad legislation done by people that really don't understand the topic thoroughly like we do. But I went through the 2008 risk mitigation decision. I went through that in an involved way. Wasn't too happy the way it came out, to be honest. So I'm a little bit worried. Because if it's done right, good things can happen. But if it's not done at all, out of some kind of worry about lawsuits and stuff, or it's watered down tremendously, well, all those non-targets we just went through, that's not going to stop. And then, eventually, there's going to be such an outcry, it will be a complete ban on everything. No, we don't want to hear about it. We don't want these exceptions. Get rid of these products. This is DDT, and I was in England not too long ago, and a, a prominent scientist stood up in a meeting, really new stuff, working in rotor control 30 years. He goes, over here, we call these products the DDT of our time. I'm like, holy cow, that's powerful. He goes, there's no doubt about it. So. Here's the thing, everybody. Even without our second generation anticoagulants, are we going to be tied up and not being able to do rotor control? No, you know, it's, it's a case of we have plenty of options, and none of them are impractical. I'm working the field. I don't see a single thing like, oh my god, if, if they take away our S guards outdoors, and again, I keep stressing outdoors, uh, we're not going to be able to do it in New York City. I can solve for them. The, mitigate, the issue, the health department in New York City, how to do rotor control. And they're like, well, how are we going to do this? I'm like, it's going to be our plan. They're like, okay. Right? So, and what's more is these challenges create opportunity, of course. I think all of us here, again, I can say with confidence, how cool is it that we have these baits these days? How cool is the good ant baits, cockroach baits, termite baits? I'm willing to bet for every technician in the room is like, you bet, man, these ant, you know, I, ant, add me on ant bait, it's just one example, holy cow. 
But if you've ever done a Centricon job over the years, you're like, hmm, termites? Well, so on and on it could go. We did not have this technology or this without good science, the first jump started saying, we have to do this. Because before this, it was things like chloridane, Dursban. And now we're thinking, hey, those are gone. And we're in better shape. Right? So we have a toolbox. We're going to have a non cigars, hopefully, you know, toolbox. And it does not mean less effective. It really does not. So if we just look at the list, for example, we still, you know, if we have non-anticoagulant baits, we have first gens, we have outstanding trap technology that keeps growing and changing, and there's some really cool things going on right now, I can tell you. We have carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide that's made it back into the use list. I've used both of these products extensively for wrap borrowing in New York City. Both of them are outstanding. There's people right now, I can tell you, that are working on some new baits. Some pretty cool people. These are high-powered scientists, high-powered chemists. It's, it's some pretty exciting things, but we don't know how that's going to shake out. But they already know the challenges they're going to have to go through, of course, in getting these registered and out and go through the, all the testing and so forth, what have you. That's fine. But the ant baits had to go through that. The termite baits had to go through that. Fly spec baits had to go through that and so forth. Number six, we, you know, I've stood at this podium again a couple of years ago and said, you know, pest proofing is the future of our industry. We better face up to it. It doesn't mean you have to be the ultimate carpenter and take upon houses and put them all back together again. But pest proofing, for the most part, is not aggressively sold by our industry. But now we have outstanding door sweeps you know, by companies, and you're going to see other stuff from those same companies. And we have outstanding ways we can you know, go in and, and measure and take care of business with holes and cracks and crevices. That is IPM, which we all say we're doing, which hopefully we are all doing. So IPM is pest, pest exclusion. It's sanitation. So it's, it's part of the bottom of the triangle. And finally, we have monitoring that's coming along fits and spurts, but nevertheless, monitoring is going to be our future and it is going to be through sensors. Monitoring is a major part of my life these past couple of years. I'm sitting on a pile of data that's like thousands and thousands of alerts from rodent monitors for both rats and mice, and the information I've gotten from this past couple of years has just been encyclopedic for me. It's like, ah, I would have never been able to assess this rodent population in this big building without these data, without these sensors. How would I do it? Flashlight, looking at droppings? No, forget about it. Getting into ceilings on ladders and spending all this time going into crawl spaces and crawling around, which I was doing a couple weeks ago, crawling through a crawl space. I'm like, Bobby, you're getting too old for this, buddy. You know? So sensors take care of that. These kinds of equipment, carbon dioxide, take care of that. So let me wrap up here, and so do we still have important uses for all of our dentists, and I'm even going to say including the SR, yes, we do actually, including the SCARs. For example, what I stressed earlier, what we're about this morning in this whole thing, the way I see it is this is primarily an exterior SCAR issue. Exterior SCAR issue not taking away rodenticides, period. Well, a couple weeks ago, New York City, right here, this is a giant office building, probably 840, if I remember my data sheets, 840 cubicles in this building. 840 employees sitting in cubicles. The whole building had a mouse problem that had been treated with glue boards over and over and over again, no assessment, no nothing. Just tell me who complained to which cubicle, I'll put out a glue board, and that was the service. Unbelievable. Meanwhile, there's a mouse population occupying that building, and it's a population that had to be managed, but it wasn't. It was just put out a glue trap when you hear a mouse. Out. That's not doing anything but harvesting a few mice off the population of the building. So when we got it done, as our team, I said, we gave them a whole plan. It's like, here's what's going to need to be done, 840 cubicles. Here's the way we're going to do it. We got our hot spots mapped out with our sensors and this kind of thing. We're going in with a Blitzkrieg, and we're going in with a second-generation anticoagulant bait. It's indoors. It's mice. They're not running out 
inside that building and scurrying around in fields and whatnot to get picked off by a predator. So he's been around forever, RTUs, indoors. I don't see a big threat. But here's the thing, what can we do right now? How do we at least start this as to, as professionals and an obligation to both sides, to public health and to the environment? What can we do? Assessment-based exterior identity applications for rodents. IPM says you do the pesticide last based on the presence of an infestation, last. IPM does not mean we put bait stations around a building because the customer sees it and we can sell something. See, I installed 16 bait stations. See those 16? You want to walk with me? I'll show you them. And they're going to protect your building. That's pesticide first and assessment afterwards, someplace, maybe. That's not IPM. That's just a pesticide application. That's all it is. And there, why not let them do it? Here, you go on Amazon, since that's all I'm going to do, you go on Amazon, push the button, I put in the box, it'll say, put these all around every 50 feet. Hopefully, we're more than that. So, and I would ask the techs here on my own route and going out as a consultant trying to do problem solving. So many times I'm asked, well, how many of the base stations, show me your data sheet in this big warehouse or this food plant or this distribution center. How many of these bait stations that you have bait in that you're servicing every other week, how many actually have hits? Most times it's like, Bobby, very few. Very few, 30%, maybe, maybe. I'm like, so 70% of these bait stations are, yeah, I don't, we don't get much. What are they doing out here? So no unnecessary exterior SCAR bait placements. There are the alternatives if you actually need an exterior bait. Absolutely terrific, fine, right? And finally, if you do put out bait station placements, you know, we put out an article, PCT Magazine, last year, two years ago, called Space or Place. To me, it was one of the most important papers I could be involved with, so at a Cornell University with Matt Fry, is we were able to prove that if you put bait stations where they're needed, they get visited. If you put them out in linear lines around buildings just be, for some kind of ring of protection kind of thing, most of them are never getting visited. So you pick your spots, and that's based on biology, not yardstick measurements around a building. So summarize, do I think we are headed to a near future without exterior second generation anticoagulants? Do I think we're headed here? Yep, I think it's a no-brainer. Am I worried we will not be able to perform highly effective rotor control to protect the public health and properties? Not at all. Not at all. We have that happy medium that Hardy was talking about. It's just we've let these get away from us in those threefold ways. So it's time to bring it back. It's time to reel it in. It's time to read the papers or whatever we have to do and to realize, you know, this is a case of we didn't really see this coming, but now it's here. We're going to go from there. Okay? Thank you. We'll take questions and answers now. If you have a question, please stand up and speak clearly. We do have time for questions. Who's first? So thank you, because that's kind of like a $60,000 question, right? That, that's the heavy lift. This is, oh, sorry. Th thanks, Dave. So the question is, you know, we have a system that's pretty lax in terms of controlling the consumer 
part of this and what's sold and how it's sold and where it's sold and, and so forth and so on. And how do we see the future developing of preventing that in terms of stopping that? So it's a big deal and it's, there's nothing simple about this, right? But nevertheless, nevertheless it's, it's one issue. If we do go restricted use, that's going to go a long way in opening up all kinds of channels that can prevent this, simply make a click and buy a second generation when you want it, right? Now, I say that as just maybe the very first thing that seems to me to be the obvious one, that it has to go restricted use, you know, for a lot of different reasons. But that one in particular, we have to have impact. And when I talk to different experts, the rodenticide manufacturers and, and EPA and all kinds of things, I'm like, oh, my goodness. This is going to be convoluted a little bit, and a lot of work's going to need. But we have to take this out of the hands of the public. We have to. Right? So, Hardy, I don't know if you want to comment on this. Sure. I, just to add on to what Dr. Corrigan's saying, there was an interesting case that I think is kind of parallel to that about, you know, how what do you do when the internet is the wild west when people can just go online and buy it there are some states where you can only purchase certain escars if you own a large structure um, that you know you are in need of rodent control for or if you are a farmer however if you go on amazon you can buy things in 15 gallon increments and nobody's asking you and following up you know are do you meet these criteria so Part of it, I think, is just a messaging thing. Uh, and I'll give an interesting example, too, from the state of Maryland. Maryland, as a state, through their Department of Agriculture, MDA, decided that they wanted to ban most uses of chlorpyrifos, the insecticide, long before the federal government, uh, before the EPA, did their tolerance revocations. However, about seven years after that initial ban went into effect, it was still being used, not just bought, not just stuff sitting on a shelf, but actively used in a lot of pest management in the state of Maryland. And when they were pressed to find out why the heck is this still happening, it was basically because somebody at MDA didn't send out the emails properly to tell people you are no longer able to use this. And once they started doing that, they saw an immense drop in the amount of chemical that was still being frankly illegally used it would it's just it wasn't the fault of the end users they literally were not informed and didn't know and weren't checking regularly to see what they could and couldn't use so part of it i think unfortunately is going to be just a, a messaging campaign and making sure that people understand what can and can't be used and that they're all are alternatives to it because that's the number one thing that everybody gets asked if i'm not supposed to use this then what the heck am i supposed to do so having those on hand ready to go Chuck, do you have a question? Yeah, the, uh, the PID was a fascinating document. There's not a lot in it. Uh, to be able to affect some of these changes would certainly be a lot easier with the, uh, the weight of the industry behind it. But as you know, we're not very difficult to uh, garner that kind of support with a document that so many of the most expensive uh, requirements zero to do with non-target wildlife. Wearing the, the gloves that they're going to require to wear, the respirators, this does not protect hawks. Uh, how, can, how can we uh, see these uh, procedures focused so that we know what to do? Another excellent question. So I'll summarize uh, Shep's comment, you know, is if how many people here actually submitted something on the PID to EPA? OK, so I, I see by my, by my look maybe less than 5%, less than 5%. So Shep, to your point, for example, EPA you know, made it very clear, and such, as you heard from Hardy, is like, send us your comments. Send us your criticisms. Send, your, send us your suggestions. Yet, as an industry, did we? Right? Did we? So, we, of course, you're going to get here from the manufacturers. I, don't, I didn't dig in to see what our associations sent in and what have you. But that opportunity for us to speak up about some of those excessive and actually inapplicable things you mentioned, for example, I, I'm against this rodent carcass retrieval. I, I think it's ridiculous. In the real world, that's, how's that going to work? 
It's not going to work, right? And not, not only that, but the, with the first generation, this kind of thing that, quote, they need more, it'll take longer for them to die and all those kinds of things. Sometimes it takes up to two weeks for a rodent to die, even with the second generation. It's not as all simple as three to five days that you'll begin to have dead rodents. It can be anywhere from two days to three weeks if you study the research on these second generation compounds. So unfortunately, what happens, and again, as Hardy kind of you know, intimated with us, is if you go visit some of these offices where these decisions are made as to, here's a great recommendation, like, did you ever run a route? And I guarantee the answer is, well, not really, but I slept in a Holiday Inn. <laughs> so I don't know what to say, Chef. We get it. It's, it's infuriating. It's exasperating. You're like, Ugh. you know, and that's what I mean. It's like sometimes you read even state legislation. I read the California, quote, ban line by line, word by word, almost like studying as a poet. I'm thinking, whoever wrote this, they really should have went out on a route. But that doesn't happen. Hey, I'm a legislator. I'm in charge of this. It's my job, blah, blah, blah. And I've got this, you know, maybe. If I can add on to that, too, real quick. Uh, thank you. So you know, I think the other part of your question is, if, this, if we're talking about the Endangered Species Act, why the heck are we talking about PPE? Because that has nothing to do with protecting you know, hawks or endangered wildlife or anything. I'm not an expert in PPE, so I don't know all the ins and outs of it. I can tell you, as a guy from the bird group that has read all these things and written a lot of comments, we did not comment on the PPE part of it because it's not applicable to my stakeholder group, which has you know feathers. My constituents are birds, frankly. And so that's what I'm commenting on behalf of. Um, but what happens sometimes in these processes, especially at the federal level, is when they do go back and do these reviews of the chemicals, they start calling, they look at uh, incident data, you know, they look at comments that they're getting from different interest groups and they say, hey, you know, this is the first time that we've cracked open uh, Brodificum or Defenicum or whatever in 10 years. This is the first time that we've looked at these regulations. What else should probably be in here past just what's being used to protect species? Well, we haven't updated the PPE requirements, so here's what we're going to do. And then if they hear back from industry and stakeholders, they will scale that back or change it. The government is actually, at, at least this current EPA administration, I won't say the government, good God, uh, that this current EPA administration is incredibly interactive and incredibly reflexive. They want information. I regularly talk to them, and the number one thing they say is, go through the comment period, submit us data, tell us your real world stories. It doesn't have to be a beautiful chart that's been peer reviewed and everything. They just want to know what the experts know. And one example that I have of this that as an environmentalist and as you know, the bird guy, I wasn't thrilled about this uh, scale back, but in practical applications, I understand it. The EPA um, not only did you know, this strategy for rodenticides, they did it for herbicides as well. And the first recommendation for endangered species with herbicides was, we wanna limit the use of a bunch of different herbicides in the entire um, habitat of an endangered species. That's every area a species could potentially inhabit. And what they decided to do after talking with people that use the chemicals, wildlife biologists, is they said, you know what, we're not gonna have these application, or these mitigations rather, apply to the habitat. We're just gonna do it for the species range. We're just gonna do it where we know the species currently lives and uses. Now, as a guy that wants maximal protections for birds, I wasn't thrilled with that, but I understood it and I support it because it makes sense because it's not just a bureaucrat making decision. It was people that threw out an idea, got feedback, changed it, and then did it to support what their stakeholders were telling them. So does PPE help save endangered birds? I have no idea. I, I'm struggling to make that connection, but EPA is also saying this is the first time that we've had a chance to crack open these regs. Here's some things that based on what we've been told need to be included. And the only way it changes is when they hear back from the people that are actually out in the field experiencing it. So hopefully that helps.
Great question. So the question was, is EPA able to work with retailers, the stores that are actually carrying the products where these things might be put out? And the answer is probably not from the EPA perspective. EPA, the way that it's currently set up, doesn't interact with Home Depot. They don't interact with Lowe's. That would all go through uh, the Commerce Department. They interact with the chemical registrants. They interact with the people that are making the products, that are marketing the products and distributing the products, not necessarily the stores that are carrying it. So they're, the way that they can flex their muscle is by the people that are making the chemicals, which is why they have to introduce so many different things. At the state level, or sometimes even at the municipal level, you are starting to see some of that happen. There are certain states that are regulating what specific types of products can be sold right off the shelf. Uh, but one of the easiest ways that they can do that for the EPA to interact with that end retailer is through the restricted use pesticide classification by making it so that you have to be licensed in order to purchase this. And then of course it takes a little bit of uh, time for it to work through the supply chain. But EPA cannot say Home Depot, um, you can't sell this anymore. And I like that. I don't think EPA should be able to do that. EPA can say this active ingredient at this concentration should not be available to the general public, which will then make its way down to Home Depot. We're really picking on Home Depot a lot today, I guess. It, it comes to mind. But, you know, perhaps now that the rodenticides are getting such wide exposure and, you know, everybody again can relate that, you know, an eagle was found dead in our city and poisoned by rat poison. The Home Depots of the world and the Cape Mine, they themselves hopefully might say, you know what, uh, we have our own obligation to what we put on these shelves or do not put on these shelves. Over time, hopefully, that maybe will have an impact. Yes, sir. So I'll just make a quick comment, turn it back over to, to Hardy. Um, that particular area, it's this whole question of what do we do with all our collected waste, redenticides and toxicants, and, and you know, we, we bag them up, put them in, take them in pails, whatever, and they end up in the landfills, and still, isn't that gonna be a, a particular avenue where they can find a way to do environmental damage? And the answer is, uh, that has not been studied in great detail. Right, to any degree, and certainly will need to be um, as to will we need to make the changes with collecting our baits, and what are we going to do with them, and what kind of packaging should they be in, and should it be a, like we do with all the other things when we go to a landfill, right? Like, well, your paints and your leads and all these things have to go over here for a separate, you know, designation and so forth, probably, right? But I don't think we're there yet, quite frankly, because your question is very insightful, but I, I don't know. My practical recommendation would be to contact the actual manufacturer of the products and not the distributor, but the manufacturer to see if they have any uh, recommendations. A lot of times they'll take it back. They'll say, yeah, you can ship it back to us. We'll cover that and we'll dispose it. I will say disposal of unused or damaged chemicals is one of the biggest loopholes in the process period. But if rodenticides wind up going the way that I see insecticides going right now, because um, especially in farm operations, you get a lot of unused insecticides at the end of the year, stuff that you're not gonna have in rotation for a while, and it hits the label, I've got you know 20 gallons of it, what do I do with it? If the EPA takes rodenticides the same route that they're currently taking insecticides, the onus is gonna fall back on the manufacturer, not the distributor, not the end user, but the manufacturer to come up with disposal procedures. So I, I completely agree, it's, it's a giant problem. It's not well studied, uh, but it, I think it's gonna go back on the manufacturers. So I would reach out to the registrant, which is you know more work for you, which is what everybody wants, right? <laughs> Yes, ma'am.
real quick before he answers that because he's the definitely the bigger expert. My favorite project or my favorite product rather. Um, I haven't seen it wide used yet. It's still kind of experimental. There's a new product for rodent control that's called Rat X. And I can't remember the active ingredient off the top of my head, but rather than it being an anticoagulant or you know a phosphide that creates phosphine gas, it actually blocks a rodent's ability to know that it's thirsty and they dehydrate to death, which means that if you eat that dehydrated to death rodent, you're not gonna have any secondary exposure. So um, I think it's a very interesting product. I don't know how it scales, but that's just one thing I'll toss out. So uh, just to repeat the question, um, very cool. So um, professional from Canada is mentioning, you know, um, that we didn't mention uh, the products as alternatives and on the toolbox list as to um, fertility control and, um, you know, some repellents and, you know, products like Radex, so forth. And I will make a comment, you know, the number one question a lot of people ask, in, and especially in big cities, for example, saying, why don't we put the rodents on birth control, right? They use that term, even though it's, everybody gets that term, whereas the actual product and what it does and so forth is, is you know, more of a fertility issue. But nevertheless, our rodents are commensal rodents, and they're in populations, in cities and in towns and in farms and what have you, where you have what's called open population, closed populations. Open populations means animals can come into an area at will, free will, leave it free will, and they can be among maybe 30 different sources feeding into that particular area. If you were to try to do, say, the birth control, there's products out there, Contrapest is probably the best well-known, but there's, there's others. Um, how do you get to all the animals in an open population of a city? So let's just say you can afford to put out the birth control in and around a particular park. Well, that's great. But two things. One is now you have animals coming, rats coming out of the subway system into the park. You have rats coming in from the outer three blocks away into that park as a regular basis. Two is the other problem with birth control in instructional environments is sometimes it takes seven months before you'll see the decline in the population. So how do we answer the question like, well, that rat's shooting blanks, right? Yes, that rat's shooting blanks. But is it carrying fleas that can transmit? Yes, it could be carrying fleas that transmit disease. But back to public health. So it, it'd be a case of, and by the way, can that shooting blanks rat, that fertile rat, get into a wall and chew on wires and cause a gas leak? Yes. Right, so it's a case where there are also candidates, however, for those products that actually are very, very smart. If you have a closed population of rats, say, on a small horse farm, where there's not a large rat population putting pressure on that horse farm, that would be the perfect product to use instead of putting out the anticoagulants. Absolutely perfect. But it's limited in its use. Repellents and other products I just mentioned very quickly, it would be terrific if repellents actually could do what some of them claim they could do on the labels. That would be fantastic. And in fact, if they could, we wouldn't maybe need any baits on the outsides of buildings. It, you know, uh, but they should be obligated to follow the same thing everybody else has to follow when it comes to efficacy. If it works, according to the way the label says, but it's a repellent, so it gets a 3P pass, a 3B, section 3B pass by the EPA. If it's saying this, prove it to us. We have to, as an industry, depend on sound science. We've always followed sound science, otherwise we'd be toast without sound science. So if someone says, this repellent will do this and cause the rodents not to do this, and they won't attack the wall, they won't go near that, they will avoid this pallet, that's terrific. And if it is, I hope you're a zillionaire when you're done. But you have to show us real life data. No data, no go. Also, real quick poll question. Does anyone know um, how many efficacy studies or how much efficacy a product has to submit to EPA in order to be registered? Any guesses? It's zero. A product registrant does not have to submit efficacy data. There's some different requirements if it's something that's going to be affecting vertebrate wildlife occasionally, but for any insecticide, there is zero requirement to submit efficacy data in order to be registered. Safety data, yes. Usage, yes. Efficacy, zip. Is that, is that also true for public health tests? Uh, public health tests require efficacy 
Yes. It's wild. <laughs> now, that's not to say nobody does it. It it's often gets called by EPA. I, I don't want to mischaracterize. But there is not an actual requirement to do so. There was a waiver signed in 1984 that uh, abdicated efficacy requirement. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, Bobby, you mentioned, uh, you know, in the spirit of strategically <coughs> reducing rodenticides, and you had your list of alternatives up there and the work you did with, with Matt Fry. Uh, in your comments on remote monitoring and the electronic monitoring data that you're getting, where do you think the disconnect is? Because in the past few years, there was such a push for remote monitoring. And then we show up to Pest World this year, and the big players, the big manufacturers for it don't even have it sitting on their tables, which is kind of an indication that, I don't want to say they're giving up, but they're selling it off. Where's, where's your take on, what's your take on the disconnect? Yeah, th <coughs> thanks, Tom. So. The question is, even though I'm saying, you know, our future is with monitoring and remote monitoring and electronic monitoring, this kind of thing, there actually is right now seems to be this big disconnect in that it's not taken off, right? And there's, there's probably a lot of reasons for this, but I, I think, quite honestly, it's, it puts a whole big onus on the pest control industry that it, once you do use the monitors, you really have to train this, not a lot of training, but you have to go through some of what is the data telling you, how to interpret, what do you read, what does it mean when you get an alert? And I think, quite honestly, the, a lot in the industry, Tom, it's people like, I, I'm not sure I want a monitor to drive me as to whether or not I'm gonna go back to that wherever, warehouse for another three days or whether I need to go now. So monitoring has this disconnect to some operational issues right now within the industry. Some of it's valid, but the payoff, if you stick with it, and there's people here that are using it and what have you, you know, that's like, we will never go back to not having monitors. I'm one of them, as I've used monitors in shopping malls and food plants and in cities, and what have you. I'm like, this gives me such direction in a rat management plan, a mouse management plan, I couldn't, I couldn't do without them, quite honestly. It was sad to see, for example, you know, one of the big manufacturers, that, you know, everybody knows, the Active Sense, they sold it off. So, but I don't see this as because of that as like going away. It's going to be pushed further and further and further. There's alternatives, there's other monitors out there, and we'll see. But I don't see us as an industry professionally going forth into the future without this electronic technology. I, I just don't see it. It's a misstep for now. How about a round of applause for our